Hi everyone, this is George Talk coming to you live from NASA Community College at 90.3 WHBC. Also streaming on the iHeart and iTunes app. We can be seen at all times and uh, we're so happy to have everybody. And this program is later archived on Spreaker.com. Good morning, this is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This all depends on when you are listening and joining us. And so I'm happy to be here this morning. And our first question today is, who runs the world? I know that's a pretty deep question. Who runs the world? (laughs) It's a question asked by so many theologians and uh, you could say uh, pop culture, all kinds of people, constantly. It seems that more than ever, people are caught up with the power and who is in control, right? I assure you, you agree with me. According to the Torah's teachings... Guess what? Surprise! God runs the world. Although these days, it seems that it's run by, uh, I don't know, by uh, media, Twitter, everybody, or a mixture. Who knows what people think who runs the world today? While the world looks to be running by itself, either on autopilot or in utter chaos, I'm here to tell you this morning, this is intentional. God created the universe and promptly concealed himself within it. The less godly something appears, the more concealment is at play. So conversely, while you notice a beautiful sunset, when a new baby is born or you partake in a mitzvah, you're actually experiencing God revealed. So this juxtaposition between concealment and revealed is by design. God is here, but he's hidden. But it requires us to take notice. That's the job of life, my friends. God has hardwired us to see our lives as mundane and contained with this so-called laws of nature. And so we are compelled to search him out and to find purpose, even when it seems there is none, none within our personal life's journey. When uh, every one of my children was a baby. The first and favorite game that we would play was peekaboo, right? We all do that. I was constantly amazed by how thrilled each child would react to the simple game. My face is directly behind my hands. The, the baby can see my neck, my forehead, my chin, yet somehow, boo, and I'm back. <laughs> and it's the funniest and the most amusing pastime, delivering gaggles of giggles on demand. The child knows I'm here, but it's in the finding me is that greatest joy that takes place as the child, as we do this together. So, again, just another week away, right, from when we celebrated Purim, it's called Megillus Esther, the scroll of Esther, and its holiday has always been my most enjoyable It is an authentic story of a princess and uh, heroism. It is the antithesis to the Disney character of feminine dreams and desires. Because Esther is a common girl with no aspirations for a handsome prince to drive her off into the sunset and live happily ever after. She is taken against her will to the palace, inexplicably chosen by the king over all the most suitable maidens in his vast kingdom, and remains in the harem of the king Ahasuerus. Meanwhile, the king has a wicked vizier called Haman, who is filled with hate. Hate for Mordechai, who was the Jewish leader of the time. He plots to design a day to begin the genocide in the Persian Empire at that time. It is then that Esther recognizes that there is a purpose in her being chosen as queen as we would say, in the right place at the right time. So she begins to use her position for the welfare of her people, and she saves the day. So back to our question, who runs the world? Answer, women. Well, almost. Let me back up. When you read the complete story of Esther, with all of its plots, its subplots, twists and turns, which I encourage, you know, I encourage my community and all of us 
to have taken time to listen to the Megillah, we are struck with one very significant fact. That if you read the Megillah, God's name seems to be gone missing. God is in the details, but nowhere in the text. In every one of the, the Jewish holidays, all the holidays that we have, we speak about God's, you could say, blockbuster miracles, right? The splitting of the sea, the lightning, the thunder, the oil. All the holidays we have Hanukkah and, and everything else, the clouds of glory. Major, major miracles. Here comes Purim. It's so different. You know, it really is no different, I should say. It has a big miracle. The Jewish people are saved. But to read the story, you wouldn't even know it. Because there's no blockbuster. It seems, uh, we, we seem to be so enamored with all the coincidences and the chances of life. Oh, Esther's picked as the queen. Mordechai is a cousin. So she has the pulse of the entire Jewish community. Mordechai happens to save the king's life. The king happens to have a sleepless night. King uh, Esther convinces the king. Isn't this just like extraordinary good luck? Perhaps some see it that way. But the message of Purim, that we're still under the influence, is to see life differently. To see life in God's way. The very name Esther means to conceal. The Megillah has the same root as the reveal. Megillah, Gilui, to reveal. Megillah's Esther is telling us that we need to reveal that which is concealed every single day. The Mishnah brings home this point with an interesting principle. It states that if the Megillah is read backwards from the end to the beginning, the way I, I read a magazine, one has not fulfilled the mitzvah. Why do we need such a rule? Why do we need such a rule? It is telling us something deep. If someone reads the story as if it happened past, backwards, back from the, they're missing the point. This is not a story for the ages. It is a story for today. The story for today, my friends, is for us to find God in our story, in our lives. All of us live lives that look like a series of chances, good luck, coincidences, but in reality, it's all miraculous. Every moment that we live, every moment that we drive, and we get there successfully, and we go through life and accomplish this, accomplishes that, it's all, really, all a miracle. And that should be celebrated. So Purim is a reminder to celebrate the divine providence of life and not to explain things away. It's easy to take for granted that which we deem normal and usual. Don't. Let us not take anything for granted. And don't see anything as being normal. Let us appreciate all the small and seemingly insignificant things in our life. S see the divine in the people in whom we share this planet. Let us take the time to acknowledge the connections we have with each other, both locally and globally. It's not always easy. That's why it's meaningful. It's a choice that we make that makes us feel empowered to look around and to see that we walk in miracles every day. And those miracles really reveal uh, the concealment of the divine human relationship. Now, why is this so important? So important that when Esther and Mordechai write their story, when the book of Megillah, the Megillah's Esther was written, they leave God's name out. Why would they do that? Because this is how we develop an attitude of intention, purpose, and gratitude. And then we ultimately can come to a child's unbridled joy that we all want. So again, let's go back to the beginning. Who runs the world? God. But Let's remind ourselves, it's the girls, it's the Esther, who lets everyone know that and remind us how powerful and deep the Almighty God is with us in every moment of our lives. 
I want to tell you on a lighter note, you know, it, tell you a story about a Jewish woman who wants to take her dog to Israel. So she goes to the travel agent to find out why, you know, how to do it. He, so the agent says, no problem. You go to the airline, they give you a, a kennel, you put your dog in it, and when you get off at Tel Aviv, go to the luggage rack, go to the uh, you know the terminal, the baggage area, and there's your dog, and Fartik. All right, so she um, does so, go, gets off, does everything exactly what she's told, and then um, and then um, she flies to Tel Aviv. She goes to the uh, baggage area, no dog. She goes to Lost and Fine, and says, "Where's my dog?" They look all over the airport. And they find the dog in another terminal. Problem is, the dog is dead. Oh my gosh, they say, we killed this woman's dog. What are we going to do? Uh, one guy says, no, no problem, no problem. Wait a minute, this is a cocker spaniel. They're a common dog. And there's a pet shop right across the street from the airport. Right, if you go to uh, Tel Aviv Ben Gurion Airport, you know, there's a pet shop right across the street. We'll get the same size, the same shape, the same color, and she won't know the difference. They bring the woman the other dog, but she says, this is not my dog. Laughingly, and making light of, of it, they say, what do you mean, it's not your dog? To which the, she responds, my dog's dead. I was taken to Israel to bury it. I want to share with you an interesting um, phenomenon. Now, if you go look on a calendar, go back, you will see that Purim was on a Thursday, March 21st. But in Jerusalem, they celebrated on Friday. Why? Because, as the McGill itself uh, shares with us, that the... The 13th day of Adar was a day chosen where the Jewish people were given the opportunity to stand in self-defense against the Haman's terrible decree. So they fought that day in the 13th. And the 14th, the next day, was a day of rest. And that became the basis of the Purim Day celebrations on the 14th. But in the capital, called Shushan Abira, they needed an extra day to fight off their enemies. So they had to continue fighting on the um, 14th. When they finished on the 14th, the 15th day became their day of celebration. So became Shushan Purim. So the capital of the city, capital Shushan, which had even greater and more enemies, took them an extra day. Therefore, when the holiday Purim was set... It was set for the 14th day of Adar. They, they included also that uh, a, the, the uh, holiday wasn't just the 14th day, but also to remember the Shushan residents that had to continue an extra day. And, they, and therefore the 15th day of Adar is known as Shushan Purim because it was observed on the following day. But they went on further. Along with Shushan, which was a walled city and is located in modern-day southwestern Iran, probably the city of Shush in central Persia or Susa in English. All, all the Jewish people living in cities that were walled like Shushan, they observed Purim on the 15th day of Adar. And this is all to show solidarity to Shushan. And that's what the Megillah tells us that it, in order to stand in unison with those who had, the, had to fight an extra day, and they rested on the, on the um, 15th, and at that time Shushan was a, a walled city, so any city that is walled would also keep that day, that second day. But here's a very interesting, strange law. The definition of the walled city was not defined at the time of the story. Rather, we looked at the city in the time when the Israelites, under the leadership of Joshua, first entered Canaan. Did it have a wall then, all the way back? Yes. If it had a wall then, then it celebrated on the 15th. If not, it was on the 14th. 
Now, this is kind of a strange paradox. There could be a city which had a wall at the time of Purim, yet Purim is celebrated on the 14th. Why? Because if you look back into history, at Joshua's times, the city was unwalled. Conversely, take a city like Jerusalem. This is the old city of Jerusalem. When the Purim story occurred, it was an unwalled one, right? Because 70 years earlier, the Babylonians had breached and destroyed that wall. Yet, there, in similar cities, they celebrated on the 15th. Why? Because it did have a wall back at the time of Joshua. Therefore, until this day, in the city of of Jerusalem, Purim is festively celebrated one day after all the other cities. Purim is also observed on the 15th in all the locales that are adjacent to the walled city, such as the Jerusalem neighborhoods that are outside the wall of the old city. And there are, to this very day, several other ancient cities in Israel, like Jaffa, Tiberias, Hebron, regarding which there's a reasonable doubt whether they were walled in Joshua's times, and the city observes two days of Purim. Now, this seems so strange. Why do we connect a story that happened in Shushan with the time back to Joshua? Why is the status of a city, whether walled or unwalled, determined not by the time of the story, but almost a thousand years earlier? What is more, um, Shushan itself, the city where all of this happened and why we celebrated, was an un was an unwalled at the time of Joshua, right? It wasn't that, it didn't have walls. It happened to be walled when the time and the story happened. So it's rather striking, these paradoxes. A walled city, which looked just like Shushan, walled at the time of Purim story, but not the time of Joshua, celebrates on the 14th. But a city like Jerusalem, unwalled at the time of Purim, dissimilar to Shushan, celebrates Purim on the 15th, just like in Shushan. Why should this be? And there's a very deep idea, and that's why I'm sharing this with you. Because, and it really applies to the world that we live in today, and how careful we must be to be able to look at something and see it in the proper manner. You see, wherever we go, these great sages helped us. We should never forget Jerusalem the land of Israel, wherever it may be. It could even be in Persia. Esther may be the first lady, lady. Mordechai, the great rabbi. He may even be the prime minister. Wow, it's a dream come true. Machaya. But we don't. We look back and connect that event with the land of Israel from the time of Joshua. At the time of the story of Purim, Israel was desolate. The walls of Jerusalem were were, were, uh, breached, they were broken. Everything else was in desolate situation. So if you looked at the current time of that story, what was going on in the land of Israel, it looked pretty, pretty, you know, down, despondent. And lots of other things were going on that really could bring down one's attitude and one's happiness in life. Along comes the sages and remind us, remember, we don't just live in the present. We know the strength of the present is predicated on what was accomplished beforehand. An event happening in Shushan brings us back, connects us back to what was going on a thousand years earlier in the time of Joshua. Everything goes back to that, to connect us back, to be inspired by that, to, to know that you can look at something at the present time and look really rotten. In, in really, you know, really despondent and be very down. Remind we, Purim reminds us again to think back and connect ourselves back to when things were full, and how Jerusalem was at that time, way back, a walled city, as well as looking forward when it will be completely again. So, my friends, what does this mean to all of us in our own lives as well? I must tell you that the Rebbe in 1952 articulated a very beautiful, beautiful thought. Just as we're discussing what determined the Shushan Purim, whether it was a walled city, 
And even if it did not have a wall city at that present time, but it did have one even a thousand years earlier, it's still considered a wall city. There's also a deeper side to that. A deeper spiritual lesson. See, a wall city represents on a spiritual level a life or a community which is fortified, protected, and immune against destructive influences. As the Talmud itself explains that Ani Chayma Zutayra, which means the wall is the power of Torah, Torah study. Sometimes a person looks in the mirror and feels that he or she is in ruins. I'm desolate, destroyed, empty. My spiritual fortresses have fallen. My emotional immune system has been severely compromised. A person may say to themselves, at times I may feel I have no walls, no boundaries. Things that do not belong in my life have entered and have caused disruption. I may have these habits and inclinations which I cannot protect myself against. Maybe it could be slugginess, despair, anger, envy. They've come into my territory and have taken over. So what we learn from the story, going back, and I know that Purim is slowly passing and we're now getting closer to Pesach. Nevertheless, I'm still in, in, in that under, the, under the influence, so to speak. What Mordechai and Esther taught us, that as long as the fortress was once there, right? We're saying now that Purim is celebrated on the, on the, on the 15th day, if it had a wall that went back years ago, maybe right now it has no wall, but nevertheless the city is to be treated the way it did have. Now here's a deep, deep idea, my friends. You see, every single one of us were born in a wall city. What's that wall city? What was that protective value that we all had? We're talking about the fact that all of us were born in our mother's womb. That was a wall. That was a strong wall. Not only physically in terms of the, the, the gestation of the child and the, all the important aspects of the ch- gr- child's growth. But the Talmud tells us that when we're in our mother's womb, whoever we may be, we are studying the entire Torah. Whoever it may be, whether it's the seven no-hide laws, whether it's the 613 mitzvahs, every child, boy or girl, in their mother's womb, in that protected environment, is studying the depths of the secrets of life. Then suddenly, after nine months, the child leaves those walls, leaves that protective environment, and suddenly finds themselves, you could say, even in in ruins. And we know we all, all have a, uh, we all are aware of the filtrum. That's a little dent underneath our nose. Where does it come from? According to the Talmud, when the child enters or leaves, leaves that wall city of, her, uh, of the child's protected environment, that sanctuary city of, of, that, of that holiness of those nine months, an angel comes and strikes the child under the nose and forgets all the study all the depth of the spirituality that the child had in the mother's womb. And it's not there anymore. It's like pushed into the subconscious of the child. So there seems to be ruins. The child is crying on on many levels. Along comes Purim and reminds us that don't think of yourself in that ruined situation. See yourself as a walled soul. Even though you may be today, no walls. Totally open to all kinds of garbage going around. Or, or, you know, all kinds of disruptive ideas. Go back. Go back to your source. And you'll find that every one of us were born in such a walled city, so to speak, in that metaphorical sense. We don't have to fall prey to the notion that um, that we're, in, we're open sesame, so to speak, open prey to all the toxic forces that seem to enter our systems when our walls are compromised. No, that's not the way we should think of ourselves. Sometimes we may feel that our own walls of our own 
holy city of Jerusalem are in ruins. Along comes Purim and says, now you have the power to reconstruct those sacred walls. You can. Purim came and remind us, Shush and Purim came and remind us, don't live the way you think you are today. Look back. Look what you were given. Look how powerful we all are. Because we were all born in a life from a life of integrity, morality, purity. The late Yehuda Michai, one of the Isra- uh, greatest Israeli poets, once wrote about this, about, um, about Jerusalem. And he said the following, Jerusalem's a place where everyone remembers he's forgotten something, but doesn't remember what it is. This is the deep memory Shushim Purim teaches us. And it's powerful enough to remind ourselves that we can all rebuild the walls of our own inner Jerusalem and live in that environment and not to our lives to be determined and, and described by what the world thinks, you know, describes us as being, each of us in our own unique ways. My friends, there's a lot to think about, a lot to be concerned about, but let us know that deep down, we're all, every one of us, creating the image of the Almighty God. God is watching us. God is in control of the world. We may not see it. We may not realize it so quickly, but that's what we must be reminded about and think about as we go from the holiday of Purim, as we prepare ourselves for the great redemption of Passover, that with Hashem's help, the whole world can be redeemed from all the negativity and all, all, you know, everybody has a choice in life. Everybody has a choice to live a good life. It's up to us to use it properly and to make it to, to really deep it does take a person to want to recognize that they have the ability to know. Think again. Every, all of us were born in our mother's wombs. Think of that as a, a protected environment. And not only physically, but spiritually, we, 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 we will be prepared for the world around us. And even though we leave our mother's womb and have to deal with a very open, sometimes disruptive and destructive environment, a discriminative kind of environment, know that we can always, we can relive and bring out and reveal within ourselves that wonderful wall of protection, of holiness, of integrity, and of purity. My dear friends, wishing you all a good week. Stay safe. Until next week, as they say in French, Zyber Zyber.